All right, my friends, I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna start debunking things in real time with short videos because I think it's gonna be easier, maybe more informative. The most recent one, I'm not gonna attribute any names, is that there's no special thresholds that any experts know about that help someone transition to a point of so-called obesity. Now, the impression here, the intention here was to say that there's uh, a signs of insulin resistance that should be able to be detected uh, well earlier and better than a BMI. I think that's a good uh, intent, uh, but then to say that there's no data on which we are finding that there are thresholds, particularly, for example, visceral fat thresholds, that's intra-abdominal fat thresholds, noted, particularly over 160 centimeters squared, square centimeters, uh, in the abdomen noted by DEXA scan, which is available. Now, most people think of DEXA scanning for bone density, and that's fine, it's great for that, but it's also arguably the most accurate way, uh, short of cremation, which I don't recommend more than once, uh, sorry, tongue in cheek, uh, to determine body composition, body fat percentage, muscle to fat ratios, and now being able to isolate how much visceral fat, because that's where it's at, that there is, and there definitely are thresholds. Additionally, too, the truth is that, you know, metabolic obesity, if you want to use that term, we can detect with pretty clear lab indications. I would say one of the most sensitive early markers is pretty straightforward. And while not perfect, it gives you a whole lot of information, especially if you're pretty, frankly, strict about it. Because if we're going to seal the deal, let's seal the deal right. Okay. And that's a fasting insulin with a concomitantly measured fasting glucose. And I would throw an A1C in there as well, and I'll tell you why in a minute. First of all, definitely fasting glucose is at most the tip of the iceberg and above. It does not tell you whether you have high insulin levels or hyperinsulinemia, aka insulin resistance, that could be going on for years, decades prior to the pancreas insulin-making cells called beta cells in the islet of Langerhan. Now, just the insulin-making cells of the pancreas burning out, that's all you need to know can occur years after there's high insulin levels and the, in, the pancreas is being a, a good player by pumping out a bunch of extra insulin to maintain this uh, blood sugar normalcy while there's an excess of calorie balance with too high in and too little physical movement, okay? That mismatch is what really drives insulin resistance and it doesn't need, can be mostly you know, refined carbohydrate and saturated fat and excess iron can do it and excess protein, particularly valine. And so all this hyper focus on sugar when people don't even differentiate between free sugar in juices or in, in a pop versus a whole fruit is silly talk. Fasting insulin at less than five, and I would even say five or less, but you wanna be really strict about it, at less than five, a fasting insulin less than five, well below what's considered normal. I'm talking about optimal fasting insulin less than five with a concomitantly measured fasting blood glucose in the normal range, you could argue maybe less than 90, but I would say even less than 100. And some may rightfully argue that in certain scenarios, even less than 110, particularly if the A1C is well uh, below threshold. And I wouldn't say less than 5.7, uh, I would say less than 5.5 is okay. Now, 5.5 is the threshold of prediabetes for the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. It's 5.7 or higher for A1C threshold for prediabetes, uh, the American Diabetes Association. And I tend to be a little bit on the stricter side because I don't want to leave any stone unturned. So you want to know the truth where we might consider myself in terms of a excess amount of metabolic obesity, it would be when fasting insulin levels are above five and certainly in the double digits, even if there's a normal fasting glucose and a normal A1C. Because remember, those are still tips of the iceberg. Now, why would I check an A1C in addition to a fasting glucose and fasting insulin is because it will give us some picture unlikely, but you know, of the after meal blood sugar, because A1C is an average of all blood sugars over the last three months. And actually it's the last six weeks, 80% uh, of it or so. Uh, with whatever imperfections there are, particularly for instance, it, that it might um, uh, overestimate blood sugar if you have a slightly low iron. And I don't even mean anemia. I mean, you can even have just a hypoferritinemia or a ferritin level even below 50 uh, without anemia, because you're not yet at a level with the iron so low that it's causing low hemoglobin. And that can, uh, that can cause a, um, a, uh, a, um, uh, a phenomena of making the A1C look uh, higher than it really is. The also, in, in African Americans, there is a uh, concern that A1C might be higher at lower average blood sugars versus Caucasians. But nevertheless, I mean, if you're getting that A1C less than 5.5, 
you know, you know that you have post meal blood sugars that are almost assuredly all in the normal range. And then of course, with your fasting glucose being uh, not only normal, but associated with a low, healthy, low fasting insulin, which means your body just needs a touch of insulin to control blood sugar, you know you're good to go, okay? So that's really more nuanced thinking about uh, metabolic obesity, separate from the BMI, that BMI, forget about it. And even beyond just DEXA, which might tell you a total body fat percentage, but DEXA now has visceral fat, but even for visceral fat, I'm still not going to not check a fasting insulin and really check for the earliest markers of insulin sensitivity with those thresholds that I talked about for those people who are truly interested in optimal metabolic health. And leaving no stone unturned, I think the thresholds I've given are quite reasonable. Fasting insulin of five or less, with a fasting glucose that is normal in the double digit range and uh, an A1C that's uh, well uh, under 5.5%. Okay, there you go.